It is an honor to be with you tonight, and I appreciate very much this opportunity to share with you the things that Wilfred Woodruff has taught me. Um, before we started this evening, uh, someone asked if I'm a descendant of Wilfred Woodruff, and I am not. My parents um, wonder why I didn't spend this much time researching my own family. But um, I can also, I guess, give them credit um, for the research that I have done because it was my mother who taught me uh, the story of Wilfred Woodruff's experience in the St. George Temple. And um, the painting that I have a copy of here was That is the one that hangs in the St. George Temple by Harold Hopkinson. His um, impressions of what Wilfred Woodruff may have experienced at that time. And the vision um, that Wilfred Woodruff had has uh, become symbolic of the spirit of Elijah and of temple work. But when I first heard the story, it was one um, that, of course, the important historical um, individuals that were involved is one part of the story, but for me the question was not why these men, I mean they did great things for our country, but for me the question was why Wilfred Woodruff? Why did they come to him to ask him to complete the ordinances for them in the St. George Temple? He wasn't the prophet, he wasn't even the president of the Quorum of the Twelve at the time, and yet they chose him for some reason, and that was what I wanted to know. That was the question that led me to the research that has lasted now for 20 years. And the answer to that question is um, more complicated than I thought. So there have been many articles, many books even written about Wilfred Woodruff, and um, dozens more written about this particular experience but they focus on the eminent men, the eminent women, the people that came to Wilfred Woodruff, not why they chose him. And so I had to go back to his journals and his discourses to find the answer, and I had to put it into context of not only his life, but of church history. So to answer the question, why Wilfred Woodruff, um, I want to review a little bit of that history and then return back to that experience in St. George. So for those of you who are not familiar with that experience, Wilfred Woodruff was in the St. George Temple in 1877, and this experience occurred in August of 1877, but it was one of three experiences that he had in the St. George Temple that year that have basically laid the foundation for what we engage in, the, the, the temple work that we do, and why we do it. The experiences were the recording of the ceremonies themselves, but also who can do proxy work and for whom the proxy work can be done. So if we go back to, well, all the way back to the beginning, we can start with Joseph Smith's first vision, the beginning of the restoration of the gospel. And the first divine instruction that Wilfred Woodruff, or Joseph Smith received, following that first vision, was the instruction by Moroni regarding the mission of Elijah. Among other things, he was told, in a slightly different um, wording than is in Malachi, that Elijah would reveal the priesthood to Joseph that would plant the promises of the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, in the hearts of their descendants the children, and that then the children were turned to their fathers. That's the only thing that's recorded in the Doctrine and Covenants. Not Joseph's impressions, not a greater explanation of what that meant, but simply that at some point in the future, Joseph Smith would receive this priesthood, and the priesthood power, the priesthood that he would receive from Elijah, would make this possible. And more significant than that was that would determine whether mortal life or the earth would be utterly wasted or not. If we accomplish that mission, if the priesthood was used for what it was intended to be used for, then 
That would be success. If not, the earth would be utterly wasted. For a 17-year-old boy, that had to be a ex significant experience. But we don't know what he understood at the time. 13 years later, in Kirtland, that prophesied event occurred. Elijah came, and those priesthood keys were delivered. But again, the record is silent on Joseph's impression or understanding of the significance of those experiences. Significance of those experiences. So in between 1823 and 1836, Wilfred Woodruff heard of the gospel of Jesus Christ, was taught the restored gospel and accepted it. This was in December of 1833. He was a 26-year-old who joined a church that had been organized for three years, led by a 28-year-old who had declared that he was a prophet of God that he had been tasked with restoring the Church of Jesus Christ. He had translated new scripture, he had received the Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthood, and he began the literal gathering of Israel. Wilfred Woodruff had waited for this restoration and for this church, and been searching, and embraced it wholeheartedly. When Parley P. Pratt came three months later to say, we need men who will come and defend the saints in Missouri. Although Wilford's brother had been baptized along with him, he did not answer that call. Wilford would have left his family and everything to join Zion's camp. And it was in Zion's camp that Joseph Smith explained to these men what the endowment of power was, why they were building the Kirtland Temple, and what they would receive if they could purify themselves and prepare themselves. So Wilford heard this in 1834 and looked forward to that experience. So we have, in 1823, the introduction of the mission of Elijah, and now 1836. At this time, Wilfred Woodruff is on a mission, and he receives a letter from Joseph Smith asking him to remain in Tennessee so the other elders can return to Kirtland for this endowment of power, for this blessing that they had been waiting for for two years now. Of course, he was disappointed. But he took that letter and he went into another room and prayed and received his own revelation about the resurrection of the dead, which was a comfort to him as he waited another year before he could return to Kirtland and have that same experience. So the importance of Kirtland in this mission of Elijah and the context of Wilford Woodruff's experiences that led him to what would occur in St. George, that prepared him for what would occur in St. George, was again what they call the endowment of power, but not the endowment that the ceremony that we participate in the temple today. The endowment of power in Kirtland was to fulfill that promise as it says in Matthew, that the pure in heart shall see God. This was the same promise that Joseph Smith gave, that if they would purify themselves, if they would sanctify themselves, they would have the experience that Joseph had had. He wanted them to experience that same ultimate blessing of beholding the face of God in mortality. In Doctrine and Covenants 97, the Lord promised that his presence would be there in the temple and that the pure in heart that would come into it would see God. So the men that gathered in March 1836 gathered with that goal in mind, and they prepared themselves as the sons of Levi had done, um, we can read about that in Exodus 29 and 30, with washings and anointings, not only physically preparing themselves and purifying themselves, but spiritually, so that they could have that experience. They had an intense spiritual experience, and they talked about the blessings of the spirits, the spirit that was poured out upon them, the blessings that they gave to each other, and also the spiritual gifts. When this experience was over and on March 27th, it was six days later when they were again in the temple that Joseph and Oliver beheld Christ standing in front of him. The veil, as promised, was lifted, and they were able to behold again the face of God.
following Christ's appearance was the prophesied return of Elijah. Moses, Elias, and Elijah appeared. And again, Joseph records this experience without any explanation or any personal impression of the understanding of the significance of what was happening. But if we look at the keys that were restored, it was the gathering of Israel by Moses and Elias, the keys to the blessings of Abraham, and for Elijah, the sealing power. So the, the description of that in Matthew 16, 19 is that the sealing power is the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And the words that Elijah said was that he committed the keys of this dispensation into their hands. So you can see the correlation between the threefold mission of the church, but also that this was the foundation of what would become temple work, temple ordinances, that we would be able to use this priesthood as was prophesied in Malachi to connect the generations, the covenant house of Israel, not only the descendants but to the fathers, but the fathers to the children. When Wilford received the news of what had happened, he was again in Tennessee, um, and he heard from Elder Patton, who had been in Kirtland, that the heavens were opened unto them, that angels and Jesus Christ were seen. So when he returned a year later, to participate in what they hoped would be an annual experience, he expected the same blessing and prepared himself physically. He participated in the washings and anointings. And there was, they fasted for days. They spent days and nights in the temple um, singing and fasting, praying, participating in the ordinances. And again, this intense spiritual experience to literally bring them into the presence of God. When I read his journal record, I thought that he would be disappointed because he did not have the same experience that Joseph and Oliver had had the year before. But he wasn't disappointed. And his words are key to understanding what I believe was the preparation uh, for his future 50 years of working um, to fulfill the mission of Elijah. In his journal he wrote, The power of God rested upon the people. The presence of the Lord filled the house. The gifts were poured out upon us. Some had the administering of angels. Sorry. The image of God sat upon the countenances of the saints. He wasn't disappointed because he saw God's face in the other saints. And I think if you look at Alma 519, we are to have the image of God in our countenances. And that means we have the attributes of God. We manifest His will. We say what He would say. We do what He would do. And we become one with Him. So for Wilford, that fulfilled the prophecy for him. And he received that promised blessing. And he had spent the first 10 years of his life in the church on missions in England and the southern states and the eastern states. And he spent the next 50 on preaching the gospel. It, what he said was to the rest of God's children. So the gospel had to be preached on earth to the living and in the spirit world to those who had already passed on. So we have the introduction of the mission of Elijah in 1823. We have the conferral of the promised priesthood keys and the sealing power in 1836. And then in 1840, we, we moved to Nauvoo, where the priesthood ordinances were revealed. So, of course, first is baptism for the dead in 1840. For Wilford Woodruff, um, again, he was on a mission, this time in England. But his wife, Phoebe, was present when Joseph Smith explained the doctrine of baptism for the dead. She wrote to him that it was strong meat, but the saints embraced it immediately. And Wilford recorded in his journal that this revelation was like a shaft of light from the throne of God, and for him it opened a field as wide as eternity. 
he had um, lost four siblings, and his mother had died when he was um, not even two years old. So for him, the motivation uh, for his preaching the gospel, the motivation for future temple work, was to share these blessings with his family. Throughout his life, he wrote pleading letters to his other siblings, to his parents, to, to follow the Spirit and to embrace the gospel. And his attention and, and devotion to this was no more or no, no less focused um, to the living than it was to the dead. So for him, he wrote a baptism as adoption into the house of Israel and, and therefore making those baptismal covenants made them heirs to the promises, again, of, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob returning to the prophecy that, that Malachi had, had described. The next priesthood ordinances were the endowment, um, introduced in 1842. So in addition to the washings and anointings introduced in Kirtland, they now had an added instruction. And this, the purpose of the ordinances in Kirtland were to literally bring them into the presence of God. The instruction in Nauvoo was to figuratively accomplish the same goal, to teach them not just what to do once a year, to prepare themselves physically and spiritually, but, but to understand what to do every day, what, what we need to do every day, to not just behold the face of God, but to live with Him for eternity. So, Wilford Woodruff um, was one of those who received the endowment under the hands of Joseph Smith. And the significance of the delay in time from the introduction of the mission of Elijah and the fulfillment of, of Elijah's return and the understanding of the saints of what it meant was 21 years. So in 1844, Joseph Smith, three months before he died, said that he understood the significance of the spirit of Elijah and the mission of Elijah. And he said on March 10, 1844, that we redeem our dead and connect ourselves with our fathers which are in heaven and seal up our dead to come forth in the first resurrection. So that the concept of being saviors on Mount Zion, so what Ayah talks about, that we would not only be beneficiaries, but participants in the work of God. That if we are to have his image in our countenances, if we are to become one with him, that we participate in his work, that the salvation of his children, to bring a pass their immortality and eternal life, is something that, that we participate in. That the atonement of Christ applies to everyone. And Wilfred Woodruff wrote that this was one of the greatest sermons that Joseph Smith ever delivered. And his record in his journal of Joseph's words said that the work of Elijah is one of the greatest and most important subjects that God has revealed. Joseph then instructed the saints, go and seal on earth your sons and daughters unto yourself and yourself unto your fathers in eternal glory. But Joseph, like Moses, was only able to see the promised land and not enter it. He had administered the ordinances of the endowment and sealing to about 90 individuals, but he never administered the ordinance of sealing a family, of sealing a child to their parent. He understood the principles, but he wasn't able to administer them. For, he was killed in June of 1844, and the Nauvoo Temple wasn't dedicated until December of 1845. So Brigham Young was the first to administer that ordinance of sealing a parent to a child, a generation, a family. But they only were able to officiate in the Nauvoo Temple for six weeks. So during that time, um, over 5,000 were endowed, over 2,000 were sealed, but only 70 children were sealed to their parents. So that brings us back to St. George. It was 31 years between the time that they were forced from Nauvoo until they could build another temple and finally administer all the ordinances that Joseph Smith had described and that God had intended. So in between Kirtland, I mean, in between Nauvoo and 
St. George, they had a temporary locations, the council house and the endowment house here in Salt Lake. But there were no proxy endowments. There were no ceilings of children to parents in these buildings. The endowments were administered to the living. Um, there were ceilings of couples um, for both living and by proxy. But these other ordinances had to wait until a temple was built. In 1871, Brigham Young proposed building St. George Temple. And in 1876, Wilfred Woodruff accompanied Brigham Young for the final preparations before the temple would be opened on January 1st, 1877. During this time, um, the 31 years, Wilfred Woodruff had spent countless hours researching his family, writing to relatives, um, ordering history books, and he had gathered um, 3,000 individuals of his ancestry to do their work. He'd been able to do uh, some baptisms, um, and yet he had thousands to do. So things had changed since Nauvoo. Um, not only did they have 100,000 members instead of only 15,000, but they had a generation who had gone without these temple ordinances. So just as in Nauvoo, um, Joseph Smith had administered the ordinances. Those who had received the ordinances were then responsible to administer them to others. And the oral passing on of those ceremonies uh, was the only way that it was done. That generation was passing away. Um, Brigham Young himself would die in 1877. And the urgency of that they felt, the same that Joseph Smith had felt, knowing his time was near, was, was to make sure that that knowledge uh, was preserved. So the first thing that they did um, when they arrived in St. George was to record those ceremonies and those ordinances. And this was the first of the three experiences that Wilfred Woodruff had in the St. George Temple that, that laid the foundation for ordinances and temple work until the present time. So, his motivation for all of this, again, was his own family. And when you talk of the promises um, of entering the temple, he said that his goal was not to just for him to get into the presence of his Heavenly Father, but to have that same blessing for his family. And he said, what greater calling can any man have on the face of the earth than to hold in his hands power and authority to go forth and administer in the ordinances of salvation? You give unto any soul the principles of life and salvation and administer these ordinances to him, and you become an instrument in the hands of God in the salvation of that soul. There is nothing given to the children of men that is equal to it. In his discourses, um, especially in the 1870s in preparation for the building of the temple and what they had waited for for so long. He emphasized this over and over again. And serving as a proxy for the endowment was an opportunity for them to recommit to the covenants that they made, to understand the ceremonies and the covenants, the promises, and the actions that they needed to take each day. So for those who had received their endowment, in Nauvoo, they hadn't been able to hear those ordinances again. They hadn't been able to be reminded of those covenants unless they were administering them. And that was a very small group. So the significance of St. George being the first temple where proxy endowments occurred meant that it changed the dynamic of temple work not only expanding the circle of those who could participate, but also the understanding of what the temple ordinances meant. So Wilfred would have had a unique experience that no other prophet or individual that I know of has ever had, and that was to spend five and sometimes seven days a week in the temple. He was there every day that the temple was open, except two days uh, when he was ill for the eight months that he was in St. George. 
And as I said, there were three significant things that happened. So in the preparation of the written record of the temple ordinances, he worked with Brigham Young, L. John Nuttall, John McAllister, and Brigham Young's son. And as they would administer the ordinances in the temple, they would return each night and meet together and go over the, the written codification of those experiences or, or ceremonies. And each time they would talk about the things that had occurred, what had gone right, um, but also how to make it better. And it was interesting to me as I read this to think, again, I keep comparing this to Moses, but <laughs> the temple ordinances weren't received like, like the Ten Commandments written in stone. They were received over the course of what turned out to be 70 years, that the understanding of the significance of each step, the understanding of the, of the pattern of the ordinances, and the reason that they weren't all revealed at once, is only, you can only really comprehend that if you understand the, magn the magnitude of the work. So if you're told in 1840 that every individual that has ever lived needs to be baptized. Imagine adding to that that every individual that's ever lived needs to be endowed and sealed and for the men ordained to the priesthood. That's what they were working with. And Joseph Smith had administered the ordinances to two, three, nine people at a time in Nauvoo, they had had 1,000 in, in the first few weeks, and then 4,000 the next month. And now, in, in St. George, they had to figure out how to do this for tens of thousands. And it was something that the saints desired. So, Wilford Woodruff had that same desire, and he had 3,000 names, and he couldn't do the work for the women, his the female ancestors, and the thought of even trying to accomplish that for the other half, the men, was overwhelming. So he went to the Lord on February 23rd, and he later testified that when he inquired of the Lord how he could redeem his family, not having his, his wives or children there to help him or any other relatives, he said, the Lord told me to call upon the saints in St. George and let them officiate for me in that temple, and it would be acceptable. Of course, this is commonplace for us. We don't even think about it. Of course we can help each other. But he said at the time, this is a revelation to us. We can help one another in these matters if we have not relatives sufficient to carry this on and it will be acceptable unto the Lord. This was big news. <laughs> there were many people in the church who didn't have relatives. They didn't have um, even people that they could do the work for. So they would never be able to return to the temple. They couldn't go do proxy work. And one of these people was Martha Cox. And she had been told in her patriarchal blessing that she would do a significant work to redeem the dead. And yet, she couldn't go back into the temple. She even asked if she could go as a visitor or just to observe. So she was one who was, what she said, lucky enough to be considered um, as a proxy for Wilford Woodruff's relatives. On March 1st, which was his birthday, uh, his 70th birthday, 154 women gathered in the St. George Temple to help him with the temple work for his family. And Martha Craigan Cox was among them. And she was thrilled to be called to, called to assist him in the work. And she said that she spent every spare day in the temple working on the Woodruff list. So, again, although this practice of acting as proxy for the relatives of others is commonplace now. Um, it was a revolutionary change in temple work at the time. So not only could the saints help each other re redeem their, re excuse me, their deceased relatives, uh, they could perform the work for everyone that they could identify. Another concept that Joseph had taught and that the saints adhered to was that, that there was an heir for each family, the eldest 
member of the church of that family was, was the heir. And therefore, it was their responsibility to ensure that the family work was done. And if anyone was going to do work for their family, they needed to contact that individual, the heir, and get their permission to do work for someone in that family. So his first experience was with writing the temple ceremonies and that the revelations that they received in answer to each issue that arose. Um, and then this experience in February and March changing who could serve as a proxy. So Brigham Young left St. George in April and after the, the whole temple was dedicated, just one ceiling room and the main endowment room and the baptistry had been dedicated earlier. So now the entire temple was ready and functioning and Wilfred Woodruff was left in charge. So the third experience was regarding um, Again, temple work for someone that Wilfred Rudolph was not, was not related to. And we come back to his experience with the, the Founding Fathers. And this again is a fascinating experience to me because they had just been reminded of the concept of heirship, that it is an heir that is, is in charge of their family names. So of the... Um, thousands of, of ordinances that have been performed, Wilfred Woodruff said he had focused solely on his family. And he said be, because that was his focus, the thought had not entered his mind to do work for others, not relatives. So with those two parallel ideas that you, you are responsible for your family as the heir, there is no one else that can do your work. When we return to, to the spirit world, our ancestors are not gonna go up to someone else to ask if their work is done. They're gonna to come to us. So he felt that, and it was important. So on August 19th, he wrote in his journal that the Founding Fathers, the signers of the Declaration of Independence, had come to him with George Washington as the spokesman and asked that their work be done. So we take you back to the letter that he received from his wife Phoebe when Joseph Smith first taught of baptism for the dead. And Phoebe explained to Wilford that Joseph had said, you do the work for your worthy relatives unless a ministering spirit is sent from the spirit world asking you to do work for someone else. So for Wilford Woodruff, George Washington was that ministering spirit who came to say, we, we want you to do our work. And if you're going to come to someone, who would it be? This is August 19th. Two days after this experience, they heard that Brigham Young was dying, and they stopped the ordinances in the temple and prayed for several days until they heard of Brigham Young's death. So it was Wilford Woodruff that they came to. And when he testified of this experience, he said, Would those spirits have called upon me as an elder in Israel to perform that work if they had not been noble spirits before God? He said they were the best spirits that the God of heaven could find on the face of the earth. And again, this is the historical significance of these eminent men and women, but why did they come to him? And he said, because they knew that as an elder in Israel, I had the power to redeem them. This experience changed Wilford's focus and again was a a foundational change for temple work in general because he not only listed the names of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, 54 of the 56 of them, two of them had already been done by relatives, but he then expanded the list to include another 45 men and 68 women. The list is an odd 
combination of individuals, um, some very controversial in history. Um, so in looking into the list, he used um, a book that had been written by a man, I don't know how to pronounce his name to this day, it's Everett Dukink, I believe, but it had been written in 1876, and it was The Eminent Men and Women of North America and Europe. And he took from this book the men and women that he felt were worthy of, of having their, the ordinances performed on their behalf. He also included um, 11 members of George Washington's family and all the presidents of the United States except those who were still living and the two that he felt had um, not helped the saints um, and their work would have to wait, he said. But it's through such experiences that Wilfred gained his understanding of the vital role of the living and the redemption of the dead that the lesson that he took was one that he repeated over and over again in his discourses that all of God's children would be taught the principles of the gospel and all would need to complete the ordinances. In fact, when Joseph Smith was still alive and he had explained this to the apostles, they said to him, isn't there some other way that we can do this? And he said, no, every ordinance that we receive, they must receive. And that was that they without us cannot be made perfect, neither can we without them. So St. George was the first time that they could do this, that they could um, ordain by proxy and therefore endow by proxy. And the ceilings that would begin um, with those families that were now endowed and could be connected. So this was a time when Wilford's commitment to the the mission of Elijah was solidified. And he continued for the rest of his life um, to focus on this work. And he reminded the saints again, over and over again, that our forefathers are looking to us to attend this work. They're watching over us with great anxiety and our desires that we should finish these temples and attend to certain ordinances for them, so that in the morning of the resurrection they can come forth and enjoy the same blessings that we enjoy. And he said, we occupy a position in this capacity of saviors upon Mount Zion. I have the same conviction that Wilfred Woodruff had, that these are glorious principles, and that it is a privilege that we have that... The mission of Elijah is something that not only defined the church in the 1840s, but has to this day remained something unique. And that means we have that responsibility, not only that privilege, but that responsibility. The, um, the conclusion of Wilfred Woodruff's life <laughs> But also the, the temple work was in 1894 when he received the revelation that it was not just the worthy dead um, that should be redeemed, but all. And that our position is not to judge whether they would accept or not, uh, whether they had been taught and received that wholeheartedly in the, in the spirit world, but that, that it was our job to do the work and to trust that they would accept that that choice would be left up to them, not to us. So, for him it was honoring his father and mother and keeping those promises that we are the instruments in God's work, um, part of the work to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. And my testimony of the temple is that it does take preparation to enter. And that the reason that proxy ordinances are so important is both for us and for those that we do the work for. Because 
we have to prepare ourselves to participate and officiate. So it's our salvation connected to theirs. So again, I want to uh, reiterate what Wilfred Woodruff said. What greater calling can we have on the face of the earth than to hold in our hands power and authority to go forth and administer the ordinances of salvation? And do we prize these things in their fullness? I know that his example, his focus, um, changed the direction of the church and that he fulfilled the role that he was sent here to accomplish. Um, he's an amazing example to me, not only of uh, perseverance. I don't think that his um, impact on the church was just because he outlived Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and John Taylor, but because he participated as a catalyst in the things that occurred. He didn't just um, hope for revelation. He expected it, and he counted on it, and he acted on it. And I pray that each of us will have that same conviction in the work that we do so that we can excuse me, be recipients of that promise to not only have the image of God in our canvases, but to return to him and share that blessing with all of our families. And I leave that testimony with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Um, so this one says, talk about the 1893 conference, talk about sealing to their own ancestors and not to church leaders. Um, it was in 1894, an April conference, that uh, Wilfred Woodruff announced what I referred to briefly um, uh, to change what was known as the law of adoption. So, to summarize this briefly, in Nauvoo, um, when they began sealing, there were many people who had uh, no relatives in the church. So, to be sealed um, was impossible for them. They had no spouse to be sealed to or no parents to be sealed to. And the answer to this problem was to seal them into the priesthood. So it's a, a whole chapter in the book, which I'll summar up, summarize in a, in a paragraph. <laughs> um, so for 50 years, um, sealing into the priesthood lineage of a church leader was what occurred um, for those who either did not have someone to be sealed to or wanted to be sealed to someone they felt more worthy. And in 1894, uh, Wilfred Woodruff received a revelation to say, honor your father and mother, be sealed to them, trust that they are worthy, and link the generations. So it was then that family sealings began generation upon generation. Before then, it had been limited to um, one generation within the church. So the oldest, um, the first convert to the church could be sealed to their parents. But the uh, limitation on that was those who had died without being baptized in the church had not received the priesthood, had not been endowed, had not been sealed themselves. So they couldn't do that generation upon generation until they had generations of individuals within the church who had done the proxy work for generations who had, who had passed on before. The next one says, did you say they could do proxy work for anyone they could identify? Does that mean living people too? So the proxy work was only for the deceased, but they could, the expansion of temple work meant they could do work for anyone they could identify outside of their families. Um, so that the, the broadening occurred to that it was acceptable to do work for others. And this had been done on occasion in Nauvoo, but um, it was the exception rather than the rule. Uh, this is a, did Wilfred Woodruff really hide or live in top of the St. George Temple? So there's a a great story about uh, when Wilfred Woodruff was hiding from the federal marshals 
and he went to St. George uh, for months at a time and lived with the Atkin family um, and lived under an assumed name, Lewis Allen, uh, who was a childhood friend of his. Um, when he, he did have an apartment in the temple, which he stayed in, and the funny story is that somebody was praying that the prophet would be protected as he hid in the temple from the federal marshals, with federal marshals in the audience hearing him say that. But um, he, he did live there, um, and the, the St. George Temple has 18 ceiling rooms, and there's also a whole floor that's not used, but those were, uh, people were allowed to stay there, like apartments almost, because they would travel so long to get there, they would do work all day, and then they would be allowed to stay there overnight. So, um, to my knowledge, they've not identified the exact room that he lived in, um, but it was in the St. George Temple. So, this question is, what happened to the temples that were abandoned? Um, so, in Kirtland, they expected to be there, and like I said, have, a, have these um, annual assemblies and use the Kirtland Temple as uh, also just a meeting place. But when the um, apostasy occurred in 1837, 1838, um, the saints moved to Missouri and those who um, took possession of the temple um, kept the temple in Kirtland. So the saints never returned to that one. Um, in Nauvoo, the temple was abandoned in April of 1846 and um, was subsequently destroyed by fire, tornado, and um, uh, just vandalism. This one says, I think who are uh, the two presidents that were not, whose work was not done in St. George Temple with the rest of the presidents of the United States. So that was um, Buchanan, um, who was the one who sent the army um, in 1857 to Utah. And then, help me out, Rick. Martin Van Buren. So he was the one that Joseph Smith um, went to to request redress for the grievances of Missouri um, and Martin Van Buren told him there was nothing that he could do for him. So those were the two whose work was not done um, in 1877, but it was subsequently done. Um, this one was, when was temple clothing instituted? So the garment uh, was instituted in Nauvoo and the temple clothing um, was, I'm not sure what you are referring to by temple clothing, but White was worn, um, but not required. So in, in the St. George Temple was when the letter was sent out to everybody to say, when you're coming to the temple, be sure for the women to bring two white skirts and for the men to have a, a long shirt made. And it was also when the, the officiators in the temple began wearing all white. Um, Wilfred Woodruff writes about um, having a, a suit made and that he and Lucy Bigelow Young, one of Brigham Young's wife, um, she was the matron of the temple at the time, um, would dress, uh, were dressed all in white on that first March 1st when the 154 women came to help him with his temple work. Um, this is who were the 68 women uh, who Wilford Woodruff included on his list and were the husbands and wives. So this one is um, fascinating to me because the 68 women, um, about one third of them were the wives of the eminent men that he listed, um, but about one third of them were listed without their husbands being listed. And then others were women who were not married. Um, so it's a, it's a range of people from Marie Antoinette to Charlotte de Corday, who was part of the French Revolution, uh, to Jane Austen and Charlotte Bronte. Um, as well as um, George Washington's uh, parents and grandparents. And there were only um, three couples sealed. Um, so again, it was a focus on the endowment and not sealing yet at that point. Um, 
This one says, any thoughts on why there are similarities between the temple and Masonic symbols? Um, Wilford Woodruff talks about uh, masonry only 13 times in his journals um, of 7,000 pages, and, in, and he never talks about it in conjunction with the, the temple ceremonies. So my understanding of, again, I only studied the life of Wilford Woodruff, so I can't talk about general everything. <laughs> um, but the Masonic symbols um, were also um, universal symbols of uh, order or, or truth or... Um, for Wilfred Woodruff, he, he didn't find the two either exclusive um, or overlapping. The Masonic rituals um, were for a brotherhood, where the, the temple ceremonies were um, for godhood. So although they used similar um, symbolism uh, to represent the, you know, what each group was teaching, uh, for Wilfred Woodruff, they were um, separate, and um, he, he didn't find any conflict in them. Um, this one is, uh, Wilfred's wife divorced him, but they were resealed, is the question. So, um, Wilfred Woodruff was sealed to nine women. Um, but his, um, the length of those marriages and the death of some of the women um, meant that he, he was never with nine at the same time. Um, he married Phoebe in 1837 um, in Kirtland, and then they were sealed in Nauvoo in 1843. The, the next, the, the first uh, polygamous sealing was in... 1840, I have to think really hard, 46. <laughs> um, and he was still to three women on, this, at the same, on the same day. And one of them um, is the one that, was, that divorced him. So let me see if I can simplify this. He was still to um, Sarah, Mary, and Marianne on the same day. And Sarah and Mary were young women who, I'm not sure they understood what it meant to be a part of the family or, or sealing and they continued to, to mingle with other um, teenagers. Uh, one was 17, one was 19. Um, and after three weeks, uh, he called a meeting and, and said to him, um, you need to, to behave like married women and keep the rules of the family, basically. Um, and, they, and he said, and if you don't want to do that, then you know, you're released and you can return to your own families. And they chose to do that. So they were with him for three weeks. Uh, Marianne Jackson um, was uh, sealed that same day. She uh, followed the first group of pioneers to the Salt Lake Valley and um, crossed Wilfred Woodruff coming back. So Wilfred Woodruff left with Brigham Young. They, they arrived in July and returned in September, and her group was coming in September. So she had their son, and a few weeks after, gave, after she gave birth, she left for Utah. And so she divorced him while he was gone. Because after he came back from the original pioneer trek, he was called on a mission to the east, to, to Boston, and was there for two years. So while he was in Boston, she asked to be released from their marriage, and, but they were later resealed. There's a kind of a note in his journal um, after her second husband left her. So complicated answer to that question. <laughs> um, then he was sealed um, to what would be, have been his sixth wife in, eight, in 1852, and she died six months later. And he was sealed to two more women in 1853 who remained with him um, until their deaths. Uh, who, they died after he did. Um, but, so I guess you'd say with him until his death. But, um, and then he was sealed again in 1857. So um, those four women, um, his, his first wife Phoebe, and then Emma Smith and Sarah Brown were sealed in, to him in 1853, and then Sarah Delight Stocking in 1857. So um, 
those were his, his the wives that he spent his life with. Um, and then Phoebe died in the 1880s and Emma was his wife uh, when he was prophet. And Sarah Delight Stocking and Sarah Brown um, didn't live in Salt Lake then. So they were, I think in Randolph, Utah, and I'm sure the family can correct me. <laughs> um, so he, his, the, he, he lived mainly with Emma after Phoebe's death. So this was a question on, on when did the when was the endowment written? Um, so that was in 1877. And this is um, let's see if, this is somebody telling me I'm doing a great job. Thank you. <laughs> Um, this question is, how much of your work has been blessed by revelation suited to your objectives? Um, I, this is a hard one to answer. I think when I began my research, of course, I was just re researching for me. Um, I didn't ever expect to write a book or, or give firesides. But when I was doing the research, um, trying to answer my own questions, um, I, I kept looking for a book that was written explaining you know, the development of Temple Doctrine, the amazing process that occurred. And, and my understanding of the process is that God revealed a, one piece of the puzzle and, and then the saints acted on it. And when they acted on it, they had more questions and they returned for more information and more revelation. And each time they went through that cycle, they were blessed with more information. It was also a process that took time because it, if God couldn't reveal the mission of Elijah and the priesthood and the ordinances and expect a group of 3,000 people to accomplish that in, in 1830, they had to, to, to be a process and a process over time because first you had to have enough people, then you had to build temples to perform the ordinances in, and then you had to have enough proxy work done that you could actually start sealing families generation upon generation. So the process became clear to me and, and during my own process of, of research I would say to my husband, did you know that Wilfred Woodruff said this and did you know that Joseph Smith experienced this and he kept saying to me, maybe you, maybe you should write that down. <laughs> and as I wrote um, I thought nobody else is, is as crazy as I am to read 11,000 letters and 3,000 discourses. And so if I can share it, I've got to share it in, in, a, in a manageable way. So that's, that's how the book came about. But my own process, the question is to be blessed by revelation. I never wanted to pretend that, that this was a calling, um, that this was something that I was supposed to do by revelation um, because I, I guess I felt I had to take responsibility for any mistakes that were made and not believe that, that God was directing me. But this is a good time to close <laughs> with my testimony that um, when we seek knowledge, we receive it. And I didn't start this with the idea that, that I would come to love this man, um, to respect his work ethic, to um, appreciate his sacrifice, nor did I expect to gain another deeper testimony of the Prophet Joseph Smith and the sacrifices that he made and his willingness to take that step into the darkness to um, seek the light and to share what he learned. But from them, that's the lesson that, that I received was if we act on, on what we know, God will teach us more. And again, um, I leave you that testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.